and your organizations as you lead uh, through uh, the crisis, through the pandemic, everything else moving forward. Now, I'm absolutely thrilled for this conversation to be welcoming Gleb uh, Sipersky. Gleb is one of those people, I told him when I heard him back in March, uh, I, I, I wanted to say, oh no, I wanted to disagree with him, right? We, we look for, we, we all have a tendency for confirmation bias and I, and I wanted to hear that this entire crisis would be over pretty soon, things would be pretty easy, um, maybe by June, Gleb was one of those people that really put me straight. I'm glad that he did in some of his thought pieces. Uh, then I went on and read his books and have followed the brilliant content that he puts out. He is a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, was a professor for 15 years. Uh, uh, he's a behavioral economist, uh, wrote brilliant books, including Never Go With Your Gut, which Howard Ross uh, wrote the foreword for, for that. Many of you know Howard uh, based on his association with LGW. And then this spring, he also wrote a book on resilience, adapting and planning for the new abnormal of COVID-19. So I had asked Gleb to actually uh, speak to our board of directors, because I think as we look at LGW and LGW's um, growth and impact in the future, we needed to take his points to heart and understand in our planning. And that's why we also thought it would be wonderful for him to share his thoughts with all of you. And obviously uh, then with a link to other members that can't be with us in person. So as he goes ahead and starts uh, his presentation, he will ask for some interaction, but beyond and besides that, feel free to type your uh, name and or question in chat. Then later on, toward the end of the presentation, we will ask you to unmute, ask your question so we can have a conversation with Gleb as he supports us and your organizations to avoiding disasters as we guide for the future. Gleb, I'm absolutely thrilled you're joining us at here, LGW. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Mahan. I really appreciate the generous introduction. I'm very glad I was able to help the board. All right, so let's talk about how you as Greater Washington leaders can thrive in the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery. The presentation will have four parts. First, we'll talk seriously about the vaccine rather than the hype about the vaccine and understanding how we're going to get out of this pandemic. That's gonna be the first part of the presentation. And then we'll talk about how you can adapt your internal business model. That's gonna be the second part of the presentation. Then the third part will be how you can adapt your external business model to the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery. So we'll have, how do we get out? What, are this, what is the current situation? The, adapting your internal business model to the pandemic, then adapting your external business model to the pandemic. The last part will be adapting your strategic plan to the pandemic because still so many people are treating it much more as a day-to-day -day issue rather than as a strategic issue. And that's something that we talked about in the board retreat for leadership for Greater Washington leaders to leadership Greater Washington to, uh, to actually treat it as a strategic issue. And all of your organizations should be doing the same. So I'll stop after each of these points and happy to take questions after each of them, as well as of course, after the presentation. So we'll, it'll be interacting with brief presentations followed by mini presentations followed by question and answer. All right, without further ado, let's talk about how we get out of this. And you've heard so many people talking about a vaccine, 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 vaccine. That's how we get out of it. Well, the common wisdom in this case is indeed correct. It's the only effective solution. We have, we've seen treatments hyped and overhyped, and unfortunately, a lot of them have proven to be not very effective, whether the hydroxychloroquine uh, has not been proven to be effective, remdesivir, which you've probably heard about a lot. The WHO, the World Health Organization, has recently completed a huge study showing that it really is not nearly as effective as Gilead and others are hyping it to be. Monoclonal antibodies might prove to be effective. They're still in studies but this is something that is incredibly expensive. The only effective treatment that has been shown to be effective so far and actually not hugely expensive in the hundreds of thousands of dollars 
is the steroid treatment. So that's the only treatment that has, has been shown to be effective. And that reduces the death rate of people who are seriously ill with COVID by about 10 to 20%. So we don't have any effective, really effective treatments for COVID. Vaccine would be the only effective solution. Now, in order to get that vaccine, human trials need to be conducted. And of course, you've been hearing about all about the trials. Companies have been putting out information about the trials, which have been, of course, bidding up their stock price. And it's beneficial for them to put out hyping up information about the stock trials. But these trials would need to test the safety and effectiveness. And they're going to take at least one year to test the safety and effectiveness thoroughly, as opposed to the usual four to five years. And one year, because we're throwing all the money that we can at it and cutting all the red tape. So we've had trials starting at the beginning of this year. The real results, the, the earliest possible emergency authorization, let's say that way, would be available by the end of this year. And then mass, vaccine, mass availability of vaccines might come sometime by this by the summer of next year. But here's the problem. So all of these trials that you've been hearing, you probably heard about, well, you know, the AstraZeneca trial was paused, the Johnson and Johnson trial was paused, and these are late stage trials. Most vaccines actually don't make it through human trials. A lot of vaccines that you don't hear about have already not made it through human trials. So it's likely that the first vaccines won't be successful. Or if they're successful, they will be the kind of vaccine that is not very effective, maybe 40, 50, 60% effective. So that's a big problem. And we'll talk about what that means. But you need to understand that it's not only getting an effective vaccine. And an effective vaccine, by the way, I mean a vaccine that's about 90% effective. So something that would actually have a serious chance of preventing you from getting COVID if you're going out there in the streets. Now, after the vaccination is ready, what needs to happen? Well, the government needs to coordinate the process of producing it, distributing it, and vaccinating people. And this is a very difficult challenge. The government has already shown eh, not great competence in getting tests out to a variety of people. So the testing has been pretty bad in many ways. Getting personal protective equipment to hospitals, not great. And then, of course, that's, so that's the production of it. Then the distribution is really problematic. And of course, we're talking about the federal government here because it needs to work with a company distributed all across the United States. Distribution is really problematic because the vaccines that are in the front of the line, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, they need to be stored at really cold temperatures. So for example, Pfizer, which is right now the leading candidate, AstraZeneca used to be the leading candidate, but the trial was stopped. So we'll see if it restarts. So Pfizer. Pfizer needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius. The vaccine needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius. That's not something that CVS or doctor's office has access to. Many hospitals don't have access to it. You, know, you only need, you need to be a very well-equipped hospital or university research lab, something like that, to have access to minus 70 degrees storage. I mean, you might have, I'm, I'm in Columbus, Ohio, you might have something like 10 places, and it's over a million people city, you might have something like 10 places that have that access. Maybe in DC, you have more places, maybe 20 places in your region. So that might be the case. But you know, considering several million people in the DC region, how do you get them to vaccinate it through 20 places that offer such vaccination? So this is a very difficult issue. And then, of course, vaccination. You need to convince people to take a vaccine. Right now, about only half of the population in the US is ready and willing to take a vaccine. So you need to have a major public education campaign to get people to take a vaccine. This is a very challenging issue. So there's a lot of challenges that we're going through to get a vaccine. So let's talk about possible timelines. These are timelines that might occur that are either optimistic, moderate, or pessimistic. So let's go with the optimistic first. That's a nice case scenario. It's going to be something that's a highly effective vaccine, 90% effective, is going to be approved for mass production by the summer of 2021. So we're assuming that the Pfizer the vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, one of these vaccines is going to be actually highly effective, 90% effective. Then production, distribution, vaccination. Now, if we're assuming a super high level of government competence, much higher than has shown so far, you know, about as high as it showed, I don't know, in let's say World War II or something like that, major, major military level scale production, distribution, vaccination, public education will take six months. So most people will be vaccinated in that case by early 2022. And that's really when we can consider the pandemic over, when most people are vaccinated with a 90% effective vaccine. 
this is incredibly optimistic and incredibly like really low likelihood. I'd say no less, no more than 25% likelihood, probably less. Mother time. This is what's most likely to happen. This is the reality of the situation. This is the reality that we are most likely living in. It's going to be approved for mass production sometime between the end of late 2020 to late 2021 to something like late 2025 with a midpoint of 2023. Then production distribution vaccination at a moderate level of government competence, substantially higher than it has shown so far the federal government, would take about a year. And then most people will be vaccinated by 2024, with, of course, that's a midpoint and the, that was between something like late 2022 and late 2026. So that's the range. That's the most likely range. Let's say this is 50% likelihood that this is the world that we're living in. And then the pessimistic timeline. Unfortunately, we can be living in a pretty bad situation. It's going to be approved for mass production sometime by 2026. That assumes that, so, we're, so here's the timeline. For the moderate vaccine, we're assuming that, hey, one of the early vaccines doesn't work, Pfizer, Moderna, we don't, I, none of them are 90% effective. Maybe we have something 50% effective, 60% effective. Then we take the information from that, what works, well enough and make a second vaccine. And then that takes about a year more to go through the trials. So hopefully a second generation vaccine works. Now, unfortunately, if a second generation vaccine doesn't work, we might have to go to a third generation. And that's something that would be approved for mass production in the more pessimistic timeline by 2026. Production distribution vaccination takes a year and most people will be vaccinated by 2027. So this is a 25% likelihood. I'd say this is likely, not the most likely scenario, but it's still very possible. And you know, you can hope for the best, but you need to plan for the worst. So I strongly encourage you to think about planning for the worst case scenario. You know, you might think this is too cynical. You've probably heard you know, hype about Pfizer, hype about Moderna, all of the, these tests, trials, showing that they produce antibodies. Well, guess what? We still don't have an effective vaccine against the flu. We've, only vaccines that we have against the flu are about 50% effective. Any given year, they're anywhere from 40 to 60% effective. So we, this is not good. This is not great. The 50% effective vaccine against COVID-19 wouldn't cut it. So this is not something, you know, even if it produces antibodies, it doesn't mean that it will actually prevent people or most people from getting sick. So this is a bad situation. This is not a good situation that we're living in. And I want to strongly encourage you to not plan for the optimistic scenario. You know, too many leaders, too many organizations, they act as though the problem will blow over soon. As Mahan was saying, you know, it's very hopeful to believe at the beginning of the pandemic that, you know, it'll, like a miracle, it'll disappear someday, disappear in June or August or something like that. Well, guess what? We have over 8 million cases and 220,000 people dead. And most likely by the end of the year, we'll hit 300,000, given that the cases are increasing with the cold season and deaths, of course, are increasing with the cold season. It's terrible and horrible. And so the worst is very much in front of us, unfortunately. Hope is not a strategy. It's a great quote attributed to Vince Lombardi. So I encourage you to use this quote and take it to heart. You want to prepare for the moderate or ideally the pessimistic scenarios. And you know what? I mean, I can understand this is painful. Like my Han was saying, this is not easy to hear. When he heard it, it was really difficult for him. And it was really difficult for me when I was finding out this information. I was researching it starting in December when I was seeing that the, in Wuhan, China, the medical system collapsed. And most people ignored that. You know, it's kind of a backward city in the middle of China. But Wuhan, China is not a backward city. 11 million people in that city produces over $22 billion in revenue. It's called the Chicago of China. It has something like 200 international flights a year, a day, which 200 international flights a day, that means 10,000 people in and out of the city. So we have a modern city whose public health system collapsed. Of course, other public health systems will collapse everywhere else if they don't take preventive measures. We've seen that happen in Northern Italy and elsewhere. Northern Italy, by the way, was the first hit because it was the city that was most associated in Europe, area most associated in Europe with Wuhan because of its clothing industry. So no wonder it was the worst hit area. So I struggled to accept this information. That's really painful, really uncomfortable. I dislike it. Like Mahan was saying, it's very difficult to accept. And my clients, really find it difficult to accept. People I'm talking to, people I'm consulting, coaching clients, it, it's a struggle. What makes it easier for me and them is knowing that in the long term, it'll be much more painful if you don't accept it and don't adapt to this major disruption. So that's what I strongly encourage you to do. 
And you want to be thinking about what is our future until widespread vaccination. And this is what we're seeing already. We're having looser restrictions in a number of states and then an increase in cases. You remember what happened in Florida, Texas, Arizona, Louisiana around the or beginning of the summer. It's happening across the Midwest right now where there was an increase in cases and then really bad loosening of restrictions, increasing cases, then tighter restrictions, and then a decrease in cases. And that's what we're facing, repeating waves of this going over and over and over again until we have a really effective vaccine. Various levels of social distancing and shutdowns. That's what we need to do. That's what we are facing. So the world you need to understand for your sake will change forever. We'll change our habits, norms, values, desires, everything because of these waves of restrictions and the underlying fear and anxiety that they produce. We will never go back to January 2020. This is not something that's the reality of the situation. At this point, I'll be happy to take a pause and take your questions on the first part of the presentation before talking about how you can adapt to this situation. So, uh, Gleb, let me mention to everyone uh, what they can do, and uh, I'll start out with the first question and see if there are any other questions. If you have a question, feel free to just chat, uh, uh, put your name in chat, and we'll ask you to unmute and speak your uh, question. As people are reflecting on it, see whether they have questions or not. What habits, norms, values, what aspects do you see as being changed post this period, whether optimistic or sort of more realistic, mm -hmm. uh, when it is over, so when there is a vaccine, what aspects of uh, human behavior and things that impact organizations do you see as uh, permanently shifting? Well, I think some of the obvious things would be much more work from home. So people, that, that has been something that has already been trending. So increasing amounts of people have been working from home somewhere between three to 5% of all US employees already before the pandemic. Now with the pandemic, of course, so many, so many more people are working from home. And I can guarantee that after the pandemic, you will still have very high amounts of people working from home because they discovered that, hey, I can make this work and I prefer working from home and it's much cheaper for the company. So a lot of my clients, I mean, I've been doing a lot of COVID strategic pivots for a number of companies, and they have been deciding as a result of these strategic pivots when they're actually treating COVID as a strategic issue rather than as a day-to-day -day issue, that they will not renew their leases. Some of them are breaking their leases because it costs doesn't cost them too much to break. It's kind of the last first and last month of rent to break their leases. Some of them are just not renewing their leases and they're planning to keep you know go to all virtual or keep about 10 percent of their previous office space so it will some employees really will actually not have an opportunity to work in the office because it's much cheaper for the company to not have to and some this is not by the way simply small companies i mean it's large companies and i'm not talking only about google facebook whatever dropbox nationwide so here in columbus ohio nationwide established in 19, 1893 over 100 years old the insurance company right doesn't get more old money than that but they've decided that they're going to transition some positions permanently to virtual so that's an obvious one another obvious one is there will be many more virtual meetings a lot of meetings a lot of events are expensive and people are going to get used to virtual events and i can tell you that virtual events will get better much better than they have been so far so you can probably see the slides on my screen they're not presented in kind of a traditional powerpoint they're much more engaging than a traditional powerpoint this is i'm using prezi video for this presentation and so kind of a next generation presentation software and this is just one example of what's going to happen in the future i can guarantee to you that there will be much more virtual reality and augmented reality presentations which will be much more engaging so there will be much more virtual interactions in the future and that's just some of the transitions i mean in personal life a lot of more people will not be going to do the previous hobbies that they've been doing so a lot of people won't be going back to dining. I mean, I know a lot of people, including myself, have been doing a lot more cooking at home. And we've discovered that, hey, you know, this is fine. <laughs> I'm saving money, I'm eating more healthy, and this is actually you know, pretty good. Or working out at home, or all of these sorts of things that you can do at home. So a lot more activities will be done at home and continue to be done at home even after we can get out of the pandemic. And something we have to realize is that even as vaccines become available, I mean, what's, what will likely happen? Let's say 
Pfizer will be, you know, 50 to 60% effective. If, it, if it's in any way effective, it's likely to not be 90% effective. So let's say Pfizer or Moderna are 50 to 60% effective. I mean, I'll still get the vaccine, but it won't really change my behavior. I mean, I'll, I'll be half, you know, half as likely to die from COVID, right? That's not great. You know, I don't want to be part of that statistic of 300,000 people dead. Who, who wants to be that, right? I don't want that. So that's not going to cause me to change my behavior much. It will just cause me to be a little bit less worried about it. So people will not really change their behaviors that much as a result of getting a somewhat effective vaccine. It will simply decrease the pandemic. It won't at all drive it away. Well, so, and then what will happen once, you know, in a couple of years, hopefully an effective vaccine is available, 90% effective, people will slowly start to get it over time, over a period of a year or more. And that will really, people will not have go back to their previous habits. They'll still be weirded out. There'll be a lot of social anxiety, depression, and uncertainty about how to re-engage with people, how to enact these social rituals, which we're not used to enacting and what's going to be the new norm after the pandemic. So those are the things that I would say would be still would be changed after the pandemic. Great. So we, we have three great questions. By the way, if you type your question, I will read your question. If you do want us to ask you to unmute and ask your question, just uh, say so on, in chat. So I'll go through the three questions uh, as I see them here, Cliff. One, how does adoption of masks and social distancing measures factor into the scenarios that uh, you talked about? So masks and social distancing are definitely factored in. It's just that they're not effective. They're not that effective in indoor settings. So in indoor settings, even if you're wearing masks and even if you're doing social distancing, if you are still in an enclosed space, that will not help you if you're spending more than, let's say, 15 minutes with someone who has COVID. If you look at the CDC guidelines, they say that, hey, if you've been spent if you've been less than six feet apart from somebody who has COVID-19, especially in indoor space, even if you have a mask, that means that you need to go and get quarantined if somebody tested positive because COVID-19 still does transfer across masks unless you're wearing an N95 mask, which is not, you know, which is not likely. So that is something that's going, it's, it helps somewhat, but not so much in indoor settings for a prolonged period of time. And most work activities, most activities that we want to do need to be done for that more than 15 minutes. So that it, it ameliorates the effect of COVID-19, but it doesn't remove it. So you definitely want that to do that to, you know, you don't want to spend more than a minute without a mask with somebody, especially if they have COVID-19. But if you, you know, go closer to 15 minutes, if you have a mask. Okay, thank you for that, Heather. Uh, Ricarda asks, as I hear about one third of Americans are now suffering from anxiety and depression. How do you use this information to address uh, people's needs, behaviors, and mindsets? One of the worst things about messaging from the pandemic has been treating it like a sprint and not a marathon. So all like you'll have a lot of leaders who said it's going to be over, you know, it's going to be you know, nothing. So for, for example, I'm not talking simply about politicians. I mean, Elon Musk tweeted on April 19th that uh, on March 19th, that based on current trends, close to zero new cases in the US by the end of April. <laughs> so, of course, he's a huge, huge influencer, entrepreneur. A lot of business leaders have followed him and believed him. And of course, he turned out to be very wrong. So people have been treating it and mentally, they've been anchored initially on information that this is nothing worse than the cold. This will go away in the summer. This will not be a bad thing. And as it has become worse and worse and worse, they have become more and more depressed, anxious, and upset. <laughs> you know, from the very beginning, when I was writing op-eds in March and February about this, I've been saying that this is going to be much longer term than people think. It's going to really extend. You're not really thinking this through when you're treating it and communicating about it as a very short term thing. You know, if, given what happened in Wuhan, given what happened elsewhere, this will be a very long term impact, very unfortunately. And that will if people understood that this is a long-term impact, if they from the beginning were anchored on that long-term impact, 
they would be much less depressed and anxious because their expectations wouldn't be broken every time it extended. So this was a terrible, terrible messaging error that I've seen in communication around the pandemic. So what would really happen, help those Americans is to, you know, it's kind of the difference between having a toothache and having that tooth keep aching, aching, aching when the dentist tells you, no, it should stop aching soon, <laughs> but it doesn't stop versus going to the dentist and getting it drilled and getting it removed, which is essentially what I'm talking about in terms of accepting the reality that this will still be several years, most likely in the pessimistic case, you know, more than five years. So if we go ahead and accept that reality, we can get our grieving out of the way, depression, anxiety. Of course, it will still feel bad. It will still feel terrible. And this, uh, as a behavioral economist and psychology expert, I understand the, how this works. The grieving process works in terms of, you know, you're dealing with getting the tooth drilled, you're getting, dealing with the grief right now, then you can cope and make a plan for the long term. So that really helps. Yeah, and I, I just uh, any of you, if you look at this, uh, Ricardo, uh, Admiral Stockdale, uh, there's great stories about him and how he survived a uh, prison camp in Vietnam. And it was not the optimistic people, it was people like Admiral Stockdale that had a much more clear-eyed understanding of how long they were going to be there. So um, a couple of other questions uh, for you. Uh, Tony asks, are these the timelines that you're talking about sort of known or accepted in the scientific uh, community based yeah, on absolutely. Sort of the yep. projections on um, uh, the vaccine? Yes, they're definitely known and accepted in the scientific community. They're known that if one of the what's most likely to happen right now, and you can conceive this by what Anthony Fauci and others in the CDC are talking about, that they're gonna accept one of these vaccines, even if it's 50% effective, and what will happen then? Well, we have around 50% of the American population who's ready to take a vaccine. So we have the, again, it'll take about a year to do that. So we'll, have, we'll go from 100% vulnerability to COVID-19 to 75% vulnerability, where 50% of the population who takes a vaccine is 50% protected. So we still have, we're in a very serious pandemic situation, and we need to get to a vaccine that's 90% effective in order to actually get the pandemic over. So yes, it's well known, it's well known that it's not very likely that one of the early vaccines is going to be 90% effective and that this will take a very long time to get to a situation where we can say we've dealt with the pandemic and where it's over, we don't need to be worried about COVID in any serious way. Yep, widely known. And, and, and Gleb, one of the things I found uh, insightful when, again, I'd heard you first in March, is that a lot of us think in, ter in binary terms and a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, in a binary way are thinking about development of a vaccine as opposed to understanding the uh, efficacy of the vaccine can be a whole wide range, how long it takes to go out. So there are a lot of other factors that come into it. And the conversation around is always about when will there be a vaccine without the understanding of how effective that vaccine would be, how long it would be to distribute it. So a lot of those things, and I've looked at a lot of the data that uh, uh, you had shared, Gleb, and uh, agree with those thoughts. So uh, Heather has a uh, question for you, and I'm going to ask uh, Heather to unmute and ask that question. Heather? All right, you last ask. question before we move on. Go ahead, Heather. Hi, hi there. Um, uh, I have a question about um, how systems adapt um, in light of these scenarios. And so I'm thinking about like the education system, childcare systems, and even whole industries like the restaurant industry, um, you know, to wait till you know, a, a 2025 timeline, it seems like, um, I mean, it's, it, it's mind boggling to think about how those systems will be able to adapt. So what does your research say about um, like, yeah, I guess that timeline and how systems will be able to adapt? Um, and I apologize for the background noise. No worries. Very unfortunately, a number of industries will not adapt well. So we've seen you know, industries like the travel, hospitality industry, restaurant industry, they're going to be very badly hit. And the binary conversation about a vaccine is not doing them any favors at all. 
because people are not thinking straight about the vaccine. It's kind of, well, vaccine is available. Pfizer announces vaccine is available. Stock goes up immediately. Great for everyone, right? No, <laughs> that's not the way it works. The vaccine is not likely to be highly effective, realistically speaking. And just in terms of how long it will take to distribute, it will still take a very long time to distribute it. So even if tomorrow we magically have a highly effective vaccine, it will still take a, you know, a year to distribute it. Right now, a lot of restaurants are shutting down because if, if you look at the restaurants right now, specifically, a lot of them are shutting down because they understand that people are not willing to do indoor dining, smartly so. Indoor dining is one of the most dangerous, dangerous, dangerous things you can be doing right now, unfortunately. So that is something, and they're going into the winter and they will not survive the winter. The, that's just the reality of the situation. And they will have to last at least another winter before <laughs> they can get to a situation where that, and that, that's the most optimistic scenario, that they have to get for the, not this only winter, but the next winter in order to deal with COVID-19. So this is not, not a good scenario. Same thing for travel, hospitality, leisure. They're, they're realizing that, you know, right now as people are going indoors, it's not a good future for them. This is not a good scenario for them to be in. So a lot of these systems will suffer greatly and they will crash and burn. And this is very unfortunate, but if you're thinking about, if you are within those industries, I mean, I have to be honest, I've helped some clients who are my coaching clients, executives, to transition out of those industries and to better industries, because this is just not a good industry to be in. And it sucks and it's rough and it's very painful for people in those industries. So this is a big problem. Now, for education, there's, it, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, a lot more education will be online. You know, right now, as we're seeing a number of countries that are ahead of the US on the curve, we're seeing that as they get their kids into school, especially teenagers who are more vulnerable to COVID, those are sometimes becoming super spreader events where kids go to school and they don't abide by the guidelines, which, you know, kids being kids, right? Not abiding by the guidelines and they're bringing virus home to and they're killing grandma. You know, don't kill grandma, but that's, the, the, that's, that's a message that helps them un understand that they shouldn't be and they shouldn't be going to Thanksgiving and, you know, taking off their masks, which many are. And so this is a dangerous situation in terms of the future, what's going to happen. I think there's going to be a lot more online learning going on in the future. And this is something that's really important in the context of the pandemic. So let's talk a little bit about how your business can adapt, how you as leaders can adapt. What can you do to prepare? You need to make fundamental changes to your business model for a future really focused much more on virtual interactions. So make a commitment to virtual teams, to virtual offerings. I strongly encourage you, I mentioned this before, to end office space lease. This would really help you out in the future if you end this office space lease. Right now, you'll save a lot of money. So I'll go for the internal business model. Just because of our timing, I'll go for the internal business model, external business model, and the planning all together. And then we can talk about them together, have questions on them. I wanna make sure that we get through all the pieces of how you can adapt. So six areas for your internal business model. First, internal controls. This is something that most business continuity plans are not well adapted for. They're well adapted for you know, short interruption. As a disaster avoidance expert, I help, I work in a lot of business continuity plans. I know the standard ones are not well adapted for the situation. They're well adapted for that you know, hurricane, flood, but not a pandemic. They're not adapted to a pandemic. You need to do a lot more to adapt to the pandemic. You need to ensure financial security. So a lot of financial security issues, especially as more employees are working from home, are going to be more fraught. And the FBI has been reporting a lot more hacking going on, spear phishing and so on around financial security, including internal issues with people stealing things because their systems the systems of security that previously prevented stealing, internal employee stealing, are no longer in place because people are working from home. Talking about that, look at your cybersecurity vulnerabilities. In the long term, this will still be going on for the next several years. You need to invest in serious cybersecurity vulnerability issue addressing those. So that's, that's something to really think about. Adapting your existing compliance practices. A lot more cyberbullying, cyber sexual harassment going on. Companies are not looking at this nearly seriously enough, getting into lawsuits, getting into a lot of trouble. Pursue compliance with CDC guidelines to the extent that you have in-person events, of course. And then you want to revise your internal measurements of effectiveness and efficiency. So many companies are still based on hourly basis where they're measuring work done per hour, for example, for 
measurements of effectiveness and efficiency. But people are not working in hourly increments nearly as much anymore because they're working at home. So they're taking time off to do little things around the home and they're working past their you know, five o'clock. So you want to do much more task oriented measurements of effectiveness and efficiency. Next, motivation engagement. You know, Already before the pandemic, there were only 34% of all employees who were fully engaged. I know one of the conversations before the, before the presentation started was about employees kind of getting more engaged, trying to sacrifice for the company now with the pandemic. But that leads to burnout. That leads to a lot of burnout, a lot of retention issues. So a lot of people are leaving companies that are just asking their employees to step up as opposed to providing support systems and compensations and giving them breaks and doing a whole lot of things that are incredibly important for you to do if you want your employees to last and not burn out within the next couple of months, especially as the winter is coming here and people are going to be much, much, much more miserable than they are right now. You, it's hard to envision how miserable people will be not, you know, winter combined with a potential election disaster, working from home is really difficult. People are not getting that surrounding tribal feeling that you get from your being at work. Work is one of our sense, a primary way that we get our sense of fulfillment, meaning and purpose. And people are not really getting that nearly as much working from home. So you need to help your teams get that and address that and also help them adjust to their personal life and their household to the pandemic. Again, especially as the winter is coming, people are not really thinking about how bad it will be and they need, you need to provide support for them. Effective communication. This is you know, already before the pandemic, we've had struggles with communication, but it's much, much more problematic when you go from, from in-person to virtual communication. Much more of it happens by text in Microsoft Teams, Slack, Asana, Mondays, Trello, whatever systems you use. I hope you're not using emails. There are lots of good collaboration systems, but they're still using text only. Written text can cause a lot of misunderstandings. When I say, I think Mahan should take that project versus I think Mahan should take that project, those two sentences mean very different things. But when I say them, they mean the same thing. When I say them, they mean very different things. When I write them, they mean very different. Th they mean the same thing. So you want to be very clear that there's written communication, there's gonna be a lot more struggles and miscommunication. This is an area where you can fortunately give them professional development. So train them on how to communicate in virtual teams. The same thing is in resolving conflicts. You wanna give them training on how to resolve conflicts. In face-to-face -face interactions, it's much easier to notice problems. You can see surprise, confusion, anger, when people are face to face. But of course, when they're doing text, you can't see that, you know, emojis are not, most people don't use emojis. Even if they do, they, they probably are not conveying their emotions through their emojis. It's much easier for problems to go unnoticed and much harder to resolve them if you don't have training in effective communication and problem resolution. Then cultivating trust. It's much easier to cultivate trust person to person in the office because you get to talk to people over the water cooler, you know, say how you're doing, what's going on, what are your kids doing, what, how's your vacation plans, how's that sports ball team, you know, watching all of those uh, things that you can really get into. But in virtual settings, this is not really commonly done because it's, this is not comfortable. You don't, you need to prov provide a setting for it. It just doesn't happen naturally. So this is something that you can create a venue for and we can talk in the Q&A about what to do. So this is something that you can do. Same thing for accountability. You need to create a specific venue for accountability. Office environment, you just, as a supervisor, you can, as a leader, you can go around, see what people are doing, see who seems disengaged, bored, confused, and engage with them, check in with them. This is not something that happens naturally in a virtual environment. So you need to create new structures of accountability, those executive up the chain of command accountability, but also peer-to-peer -peer accountability because previously you can pop into Mary's office and say, hey, Mary, where's that report that you were gonna send me? And it's much harder for Mary to ignore you when you're standing in her doorway than when you send her a Slack message. So that provide that peer-to-peer -peer accountability. Next, external business model. So six areas of external business model, service delivery. So you want to be very seriously thinking about transitioning to virtual or socially distant service delivery, product delivery. I mean, I'm doing all my presentations virtual, all of them, I, almost all of them. I did uh, some strategic retreats in person because companies really wanted that. But I'm doing some strategic retreats virtually and some hybrid uh, events. You want to think about how you can do whatever you can do virtually, really try to do that. Some will find easier than others, obviously, 
some will not succeed very well, like restaurants offering indoor dining experiences. Now, there are ways of being creative. So for example, some restaurants that are trying to offer a more high touch dining experience are offering their takeout, not in you know, plastic trays, but in highly fashionable accessories where people can plate their food nicely. So that's more likely to survive. But uh, for most of them, the best choice might be to close. Then relationships. This is a matter of professional development. You need to know how to use virtual interactions to establish new relationships and cultivate existing ones. So that's what you want to be focusing on. With clients, service providers, political leaders, prospects, so all sorts of suppliers, all suppliers, all sorts of external stakeholders. So this is professional development, just like effective communication, problem solving. Managing disruptions. You want to be thinking about your external stakeholders and what kind of disruptions will result from them. Will there be supply chain disruptions? Will service providers go through disruptions? What kind of disruptions will there be? Will investors not be able to invest money in your company anymore? Most people, now that you're checking out this webinar and you're you know, combined with what Mahan is saying, you're thinking about the long term strategically, you will be much more prepared for the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery. Most won't be. So you need to protect yourself from their failures. Shifting norms. So we talked about shifting norms, some examples of them. After these years of restrictions and loosenings, you'll have a lot of different norms, wants, values, desires. Think about specifically what's going on in your industry. What applies to your industry? Obviously with my industry of consulting, coaching, training, that's what I do in risk management, decision-making and strategic planning, a lot more virtual interactions are going on and people are much more used to it. And the, there's much more focus on providing effective content rather than person-to-person -person interactions face-to-face. -face. So you want to anticipate this shift and get ahead of it by providing, you know, I'm using this engaging software and doing a lot of other stuff, creating online classes. You want to be thinking about what you can do to get ahead in your industry of these shifts. Unknown unknowns. This is a big one. People have thought about the pandemic as a, you know, unpredictable event, but it was predictable. Bill Gates and so many other people were talking about the likelihood of a pandemic. You know, pandemic insurance is something that you can get as a rider on your current insurance, but most people, most businesses didn't get it and they got into, they, and as a result, they're suffering a lot. Businesses that got pandemic insurance are doing fine. <laughs> so you want to scan your environment for potential major disruptors. Of course, the one coming down the pipeline is the potential of an election being a disaster. And you'll have a presentation coming up in the end of October about that. But if you want to be thinking about this, the, elect the counting of the votes with major, major mail-in ballots will be take much more time. And there's a lot of delegitimization of, of mail-in ballots, which will make people perceive it as unfair and questionable and likely result, very likely result in people going out in the street protesting against, you know, stop the account, stop the account, stuff like this. And then you'll have the people from the other side coming out and trying to protest this. Don't stop the account, don't stop the account. So what will happen? Well, you'll have a lot of clashes, civil disorder, disobedience. This is a major potential disaster coming down the pipeline. I, I haven't seen companies preparing for that. This is ludicrous to me that they're not preparing for it. There's so many things that they can be doing do to prepare for it. And I can talk about that in the Q&A. So you want to protect yourself against them. Of course, not everything can be predicted. For that, you want to maintain a cash cushion for protection. Outcompeting your competition. This is the sixth area that you want to be thinking about for external business model transformation. If you take the steps that I suggested for your internal business model and your external business model, that will really help you gain a competitive advantage in your industry, like Mahan was talking about that. Many people will fail to adapt to the pandemic. Many of your competitors will fail to adapt to the pandemic. You will not. So you, this is an opportunity for you to get ahead of them, seize market share, and hire away good employees. All right. I'll talk about what you can do for, to plan for the long-term impact of the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery. So, there are six steps for what you can do. So think about the possible futures. What futures apply most to your industry, to your situation, to your company? And of course, as the best and invest your resources accordingly. As a baseline, use at least the three scenarios that I talked about, the optimistic one, the moderate one, and the pessimistic one for vaccine availability. And then just apply them with various variations to what you're doing in your company and what's going on in your industry. Then five years out. What will happen for your company, for you as a leader, perhaps for your household, five years out? What, your business, what will your business look like in that scenario, in each of these timelines? 
think about the optimistic one. So pandemic over in you know, a year and a half, and then three and a half years of post-pandemic recovery. The moderate one, pandemic over in about four years, and then one year of post-pandemic recovery. That's the five-year timeline. And then pessimistic, uh, five years still the pandemic, and then two more years after that. And think about the problems. What kind of problems will you face in your business in each of these scenarios? So think about that. What will you face in each of these scenarios? It applies to you. You know, a number of my clients, for example, have been seeing that the decision making is changing for their products. Whereas previously, the production staff, let's say from a manufacturing client that uh, I work with, previously the operation staff have been the, doing the decision making on what kind of manufacturing products to get. Now that's shifting much more to accounting where they're really pressing operations to come up with the cheapest alternative. And my company provides high quality, high priced gadgets, which of course the operations people like, but accountants don't like. And so the company that I was doing the strategic retreat for realized that, hey, they're actually losing market share to these lower price alternatives because they're not able to provide an effective ROI justification of how their quality is actually good from an accounting perspective. They're certainly great from an operations perspective, but not from an accounting perspective. So they're changing their gadgets to provide ROI from an accounting perspective to show how the quality of their products is actually going to significantly improve the, the perspective on buying their products from cheaper alternatives. So that's what you want to do about thinking of ways of addressing problems in advance in the long term. Of course, some problems might not come up. So you want to make a pro you want to make a plan to resolve them if they do occur. So for example, a major outbreak in your company. Opportunities. What kind of opportunities might you be facing? So think about those opportunities in each scenario and how can you bring them into life? So for example, one of my clients has been seeing that their competitors are not really taking the steps to be pandemic proof. And so they have been changing their marketing and selling and going to their prospects who are currently working with their competitors and saying, hey, you know, well, Mr. Prospect or Mrs. Prospect, I've been with taking these steps A for F to be pandemic proof. And I can guarantee to you that there will not be service interruptions if you work with us. So that's going to be great for you if you work with us. And then if you don't want to work with us, if my competitor is going to be stumbling, think about giving me a call. And I can guarantee to you that they're going to be getting some calls. They are, in fact, they already are. Make a plan to seize opportunities if they occur. And think about resources. What kind of resources might they, you need in each of these scenarios? Money, time, information, social capital, strategic planning. Do your strategic planning in advance, not when the problem occurs. Make a plan to reserve sufficient resources for the pessimistic scenario, I strongly encourage it. You wanna hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Don't plan for the optimistic scenario. And finally, information. What kind of information will you need to assess which of these scenarios is taking place? Look at that information, monitor it closely, and adjust your plans accordingly. And then execute, execute, execute. All right, so that's adapting to the pandemic and then doing adapting to the your plan to the long-term strategic strategy of the recovery from the pandemic. So let's talk about this. Questions? Yeah, so I, uh, I typed in, anyone wants to uh, ask the questions, feel free to type it in. We do have time for a couple of questions or type your name and uh, ask you to unmute and ask Gleb your question. So uh, Gleb, uh, this is all very relevant in terms of uh, sort of strategic planning. One of the challenges that I have seen, uh, whether it is in your conversation now with the board, with lots of other groups that I've, uh, I've seen you talk to, there is a desire for us to gravitate toward trying to think only about the best case scenario, right? I mean, we are all, we're all as entrepreneurs, as leaders, we're optimists, we like to be optimists and we like to see the optimistic scenario. How would you advise us to effectively be able to plan for the different scenarios and maybe be pleasantly surprised when things work out better than anticipated? But how would you advise us to really shift our mindset? Uh, give a couple of quick uh, thoughts on that. And I know uh, there is another question that I'll ask you about too. First thing to remember is that about half of all startups fail. So half of all entrepreneurs fail, and that's in a regular environment. 
I can guarantee to you that that number will shoot up. Half of all startups fail within the first five years, three quarters fail within the first 15. I can guarantee to you that that number will shoot up with COVID-19. Do you want to be in the failures? Do you want to be in that range? That's, you know, that's what you're gonna get if you go for the hopeful scenario. If you look at the causes for failure, you have two primary causes. One is running out of money. So there are two overwhelming. One is running out of money and that's a bad strategic planning because you're, it, it's, a com it's, an enter it's a startup that would have been profitable if it gathered sufficient money earlier to, and then to not run out of money, have been smarter about using its money and been more focused, but it ran out of money and it failed. The other is lack of fit of product to market. So when a startup, when entrepreneurs have not done enough research in order to w figure out what kind of product to offer. Now, this is the, these are entrepreneurs who have been hoping for the best case scenario. They've been hoping that they gathered enough money to, for their startup to work. Well, they didn't. And they've been hoping that the market would like their product because they like their product and therefore the market should like it. Well, that's not what worked out. So do you want to be in those failures or do you want to be in the successes? The people who succeed, the entrepreneurs who succeed overwhelmingly the, as part of their characteristic, look out for problems, look out for risks, look out for failures, look out for cliffs, and then try to not jump over the cliffs. The ones who hope for the best will jump over the cliffs. So do you, it's just a question of which, which of these groups do you want to be in. You never want to gravitate toward the most optimistic scenario because that means that you're essentially risking, the, you're jumping over a cliff blindfolded without being confident about whether the cliff is you know, a short, whether it's a short cliff and you can easily get to the other side or whether it's something that you really should, cannot jump over. So don't do that. Don't be that person. You want to really hope, while hoping for the best, that's great, you want to plan for the worst. And I tell you that as someone who's an inveterate optimist, I see the glasses half full, I see the future as mostly friendly and great, but this is something that, as I analyze that this is not great, and I have to be realistic with myself and with you that this is not a brilliant future. So that's what I would say. So one, one uh, final question as we wrap up uh, from the same person, uh, I'm combining a couple of questions. One is a question about uh, would ra rapid testing sort of help bring the economy back? Mm -hmm. And also uh, this individual has the opportunity to go fully into a virtual offering and or uh, also having um, in-person offerings for the foreseeable future, your thoughts with respect to that, and then feel free to wrap up from there. Happy to. I definitely think that rapid testing would... Oh, sorry about that. Though so I think that definitely rapid testing would be very effective if it's available. Right now, unfortunately, the US has not shown high ability in distributing testing contact tracing and isolation kind of regimes. That would be effective. I mean, that's what New Zealand did and a number of other countries that have been able to, Australia that have been mostly able to stamp out, so South Korea that have been able to stamp out COVID-19 with combination of rapid testing and then contact tracing isolation. It's just not something that I see the US as doing at all. So I think we'll probably get the vaccine before the government gets its stuff together well enough to actually implement these sort of strategies, unfortunately. So I, that's one. Second, I think virtual would be definitely the best offering to go through for that's going to be much more long term for you. It's something that you can figure out. It's going to be in you know, the next several years. That's what many people will want. And you can always do in person. But if you are on that cutting edge of virtual, you'll be in a much better shape. So I strongly encourage that. And uh, the last thing I want to tell you, so I'll, for whoever wants, I'll, I'll be sharing some chapters from my book so you can have that. And uh, let's see, I will go here. So you can get additional resources, go to tinyurlcom dash forward slash D dash event for a free coaching session with me and two chapters from my book, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal. So again, go to that website tinyurl.de-event and then from there you you can find that information in order to get that information i'll be happy to do a coaching session with you if you haven't had your questions answered on anything that you wanted 
from this presentation. So I'll, I tapped, typed the link into the chat for those of you who would like that. Yeah, re really, really appreciate the insights clip. And again, part of, part of why I was really excited to bring your thoughts to our board and to our LGW community is that I got a couple of chat messages also for people saying, this is hard to hear. And I, uh, b believe me, I, 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 I relate to it and I understand. And I understand our need to try to sort of glom on to the uh, positives. We should, being optimistic is fabulous, but part of the point you're making is in planning for our businesses, we do need to look at data and keep our cognitive biases mm -hmm. out of our planning. So I um, uh, read a lot of what Gleb puts out and I really appreciate the thoughts and perspectives that you share. It's brilliant. Feel free to connect with Gleb uh, through the link that he uh, put on there. Really appreciate you all joining as uh, uh, Gleb is supporting us and uh, at LGW, helping all of our members become better, more impactful with our eyes wide open. Because there are, th this entire crisis also does provide lots of opportunities for people that plan effectively. So really, really appreciate your insights, Gleb. Thank you all for joining and look forward to seeing you at many more LGW events. Thank you all. And thank you, Gleb. Thank you all. You're welcome, David and Marla and Megan and Tony and Ricardo and Carla. <laughs> Glad that you enjoyed the presentation. Yeah, fantastic. It's, uh, uh, as always, again, it's, 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 it's hard to hear, Gleb. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is uh, of all the presentations I do, this is definitely the most depressing one, unfortunately. So yeah, yeah it's a realistic evaluation of the future, but it's, you know, sometimes realism is hard to hear. And, and as, as leaders, part of our responsibility is just to, uh, again, take into account all of these different factors uh, moving forward. So really, really appreciate that. Uh, Bye all. Wonderful seeing you. Great seeing everyone. See you. Bye.